Good morning. Great uh, to be able to gather um, weather-wise, health-wise, freedom-wise. So thank you for gathering for worship this morning. I invite you to uh, send the blue friendship book down, put your name, other information there, and send it back to the center if you would. Just a reminder that today after this service, there are classes for all ages, adults, We've got Martin Luther class here in the sanctuary and then sharing the good news in Pastor John's office. Mr. Oglesby. Good morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements to get us going for the morning. I'll be referencing the uh, bulletin insert. Uh, taking it from the top, um, this Wednesday, December 15th at 4 o'clock, we're having our next moms group. If you're interested in joining that, you can contact uh, myself or Karina Isley. Uh, we also have our youth Christmas party. It was scheduled for this Friday. It got rescheduled to tonight, so you didn't miss it. Uh, it's going to be from 6 to 8 p.m., so go out and buy an ugly sweater or maybe borrow one from your parents. <clears throat> um, we have our Christmas program. December 19th It's going to be at 6.30 p.m. There's a lot more information in the bulletin, so you can follow along with that. But we will be having rehearsal December 18th from 2 to 3.30. And then on the other side of the bulletin insert, this is what we have offered um, every week. So you can follow along with that. If you have any questions about any of that, you can contact me or one of our uh, office staff as well, and we'll be able to point you in the right direction. If you're joining us online, we actually have the bulletin and the bulletin insert available for you as well. It should be on the lower half, right under the big sermon video as well. And then that's for everyone else. If you misplace your bulletin or if you want to have a good idea of what's going on, you can go online onto our website. And then under the sermon section, go down and then you can uh, download the bulletin and then our week's uh, insert announcements for the week as well. If you have any questions about any of that, you can contact me also. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Do notice that today is our final olive wood and fair trade sale, and that's in the fellowship hall. Also, uh, please do notice right in here that uh, we're still looking for people to help set up and clean up for coffee and our fellowship hour, so uh, please do talk to Lisa about that. Also notice a little further down, next week, that's the choir cantata, and uh, I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, that's something that uh, perhaps you might even tell a neighbor about and invite them. Christmas Eve candlelight worship also notice the times 3.30, 5.30, and 7.30. Uh, just to review, this symbol is out uh, every Sunday during Advent. What does it mean? What are the letters? It's Greek. That's right, Christ. And it's the key, that's the letter key, it's an X, and then it's an R. It doesn't look like it because we're thinking English, but uh, that's a uh, little reminder of that in your bulletin. Number of other things I invite you to look at, but for that we will allow that to be enough. I invite you to turn to the front part of your hymnals, page 94, for the brief order of confession. Then please stand and face the baptismal font. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have 
left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you all the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Turn to the front part of your hymnals, page 138. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The prayer of the day is printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Almighty God, you once called John the Baptist to give witness to the coming of your Son and to prepare his way. Grant us, your people, the wisdom to see your purpose today and the openness to hear your will, that we may witness to Christ's coming and so prepare his way. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. I invite the children to come forward.
Well, good morning. Isn't this such a nicely wrapped and pretty present? There's only three pieces of tape on it, and it's all shiny. That's how you know I didn't wrap it. If I wrapped it, there would be more tape than there is paper. Not, not very good at that. Have you got all of your presents under the Christmas tree yet, Jason? No, not just yet. Do they usually wait a little bit longer to put them on? Yeah. You have some, just not a lot. When I was, I was maybe a little bit younger than you. I know you have an older sister. I have an older sister too. When I was a little bit younger than you, on Christmas Eve, I got up early and I went to the Christmas tree. Do you know why I went there? I wanted to count how many presents I had and how many presents my sister had. Have you ever done that before? Yeah, that's good. Good answer. Wouldn't you know it, I found that my sister had more Christmas presents than I had. Ah, oh, the shame. I don't know how I ever recovered, Jason. But do you know what happened? I actually got upset. I got upset because my sister had more stuff than I did. Now, I had all the stuff that I had on my Christmas list. She had all the stuff. She had smaller stuff. I had bigger stuff. But I still got upset because I felt like I was getting less than what my sister got for Christmas. In our gospel lesson today, we hear from John. He's getting us ready for Jesus. He's preparing the way for Jesus, just like we are getting ready for Christmas. And he tells us that it's actually better to give than to get. He said, if, if you have two coats, you should give one to someone else in need, and then you can have the other coat. John says that we should treat everyone fairly, and that we should be nice to one another. And so I learned that day, and I learned much later on as well, that it's actually better to give than to get. It feels better when you have a family member or someone you love that's opening something that you either made or, or that you gave special to them. Later on, I realized that it means more than actually getting all this stuff. But our joy doesn't come from how well we wrapped stuff or how well we didn't wrap stuff or what's inside. Our joy comes from Jesus. So my challenge for you and for the rest of us is to share your joy with somebody else this week. Maybe we share them the good news of what Christmas is about. Maybe if we have something that we don't play with anymore, we can give it to a friend or something like that. But think of a way that you can share your joy with somebody else this week. Think we can do that? All right, let's pray. Will you pray with us? Dear Jesus, thank you for mom and for dad. Thank you for grandpa and grandma. Thank you for all the gifts that you've given us. Help us to give the gift of joy to one another this Christmas season. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right. <coughs> first lesson this morning is found in Zephaniah in the third chapter. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. 
The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time. And I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home at the time when I gather you. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Our second reading is found in the fourth chapter chapter of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Here ends the lesson. Hear the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 3. John the Baptist said to the crowd that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Into the, fire. the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. Whoever has food must do likewise. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized. They asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered them all by saying, I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie, untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff, he will burn with unquenchable fire. 
So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. What should we do? It's a great question. How will we order our days? How will we spend our energy, our time? How will we use our God-given gifts? It's kind of the same that's in the words of our prayer of the day. How will we hear God's will and witness to Christ's coming? What would that look like in our lives? How will we live? What shall we do today, tomorrow? We see in today's readings that this question is a response to one of two things. I would suggest either fear or faith. We look closer. Today's gospel, you hear John the Baptist. He announces that someone is coming. And one might very well respond with fear. Notice what he said. You brood of vipers. Now is that a way to start a speech? <laughs> Most of us did not learn that in school. You bunch of snakes. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Already, we're beginning to uh, be a little defensive. And then, he says, bear fruit. <coughs> Live in such a way that you bear fruit worthy of repentance. In other words, bear fruit. Live in a way that matches your intent to follow the Lord. And then he says, don't simply say that we're children of Abraham. It's my name, it's my reputation I've got. He says, oh, that's not enough. And then it gets worse. Even now, what is laid to the root of the tree? Oh, an ax. Well, that's sharp, that's dangerous. An ax is laid to the root of the trees. Any tree, any of us, that do not bear good fruit, well, what will happen? Boom, cut down, and the wood thrown into the fire. And I love how it ends. And with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. <laughs> yikes. The people hearing had to think, yikes. The coming one sounds frightening. And so they cry out, out of their fear, what shall we do? And he tells them, well, if you have two coats, consider giving one to somebody who doesn't have a coat. If you have food, consider sharing it. It's only right. And if you are a tax collector, well, don't collect more than is allotted. Don't use and abuse people. And if you're a soldier, be content with your wages and don't use your power to somehow extort money from people. Treat others with respect and care. Kind of sounds like what Jesus tells us. Remember what the great commandment is? Love God, love your neighbor. It even sounds a bit like the golden rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. John the Baptist simply responds when people say, what shall we do with what makes sense for God's people? Treat other people well, just the way you would want to be treated. But we get the impression that the people are asking the question, and then following through because they're afraid of what happens if they don't. The motivation is fear. 
There is another motivation. Rather than fear, it could be faith. Growing to know and trust the one who is coming and seeing who he really is. Look at the first reading. It's from Zephaniah. You just heard it. The Lord is coming. And therefore what? It's not a scary message, but rather the opposite. You shall fear no more. This is the one that's coming. Or later in the reading, God is in your midst. Therefore, it's the invitation. Do not be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. He is with you. What a different feel from that which John the Baptist gives. Now, to be fair to John the Baptist, he didn't have much time to see Jesus in action. Remember where he was? In jail. The very next paragraph from our Gospel reading is it says that John the Baptist ended up being put in jail just as Jesus, right after Jesus was baptized. So he didn't see with his own eyes. He didn't hear with his own ears what Jesus was saying and doing. John expected Jesus to be like himself. Bluster and axes and fire. And so in prison, when he begins to hear about what Jesus is saying and doing, he thinks this isn't the right picture. And he sends a message to Jesus. And the question is this. Are you the one that is to come? Or shall we look for another? And Jesus says to the messenger, Go tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised. And blessed are those who take no offense at me. This is the one who is coming. The one who comes, comes to heal. And to restore and to give life. When we come to know him and see how much he cares, what he wants, how he wants us whole. Well, we begin to become more like him. Loving God, loving neighbor, not overcharging, not using and abusing people, sharing what we have, our clothes, our food. Such action simply flows out of our relationship with him. It's not out of fear that we ask the question, what shall we do? Rather, it's out of faith and trust. Well, today, what shall I do? It's a whole different motivation. So how does this relationship with him grow? Can you give me a couple building blocks? <coughs> we might worship how often? Weekly, Weekly meaning W-E-E-K. <laughs> we read the Bible how often? Daily. Daily and we pray? A lot. Look at the uh, second lesson, Philippians. One of my all-time favorites. Rejoice in the Lord, always. We don't have to cower. We don't have to be afraid. No, as we come to know him, we see that the Lord is good. And so rejoice in the Lord, always. Again, I say rejoice. Let everyone know your gentleness. Let everyone see how you live. Because that's a reflection of what you know about him. And then it's this little line. Do you see it? Four words. Somebody say it. The Lord is near. Ah, the Lord is near. The one who is coming is actually here. He is near. He is close. He is as close as your next breath. And his love and his presence are active and helpful 
the Lord is near. And then the next word is helpful. If the Lord is near, this crucified, risen one, if he is near, then there is no cause for fear. Then you, in fact, are not alone. That you don't face tomorrow all by yourself. He is near. He is with you. Emmanuel, God with us. The Lord is near. And then he simply says, don't worry. Don't be afraid. You don't have to be anxious. The invitation is trust him. Put your life in his hands. Don't worry about anything. Yeah, but if I don't worry. <laughs> Paul simply says the Lord is near. You don't have to worry. But rather than worry, pray. Remember that little thing? When you worry, where do you keep everything? Right in your own little hands. And when you pray, where do you put it? In his hands. It's the same amount of time. It's the same amount of effort. It's the same amount of energy, worry, and prayer. The only difference is where you keep it. And you keep it here, you will be afraid. And if you put it here, we learn that he is able and willing. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. But with prayer, let your requests be made known to God. And the clincher and the peace of God. The peace of God which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. As we began our worship with that Kyrie prayer, three times you hear the word peace. In peace let us pray to the Lord. You say what? Lord have mercy. For the peace from above. That's not just any old peace. That's God's peace. That's the peace that he brings. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. You say, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world. He is the king of peace. We are surrounded with the word. There's a banner over there that says peace. There's another one here. He brings peace to us. And it's always available. It's always there for the receiving. It's just that often we're too busy, worrying. But he continues to invite. He continues to remind, I'm here. Turn to me. When we live in his peace, knowing it's not all up to us, knowing that he is at work always for good, peace begins to color our lives. And what is it that we do? Well, we simply become like him because he's living in and through us more and more and we end up loving God and loving who? Our neighbor. Not using and abusing, sharing what we've got. That's what we do. Not because we're afraid if we don't, but simply because he is Lord. Peace. It starts with him, the time we spend with him. Here, gathered, reading his word, prayer. How many of you have the Advent devotion book? Uh, yeah, I wander as I wander. <coughs> if you don't have one, there aren't any left. <coughs> there was one, the first week, page eight, it's called Hush. And the author invites us to do an experiment. Carve out space, you know, it might be five or ten minutes. Some space in your day and sit in silence 
with God. Being silent can be a recipe for the remembering of the tasks that need to be done in this busy time of year. The author suggests keeping a little piece of a paper and a pen next to you so you can jot down your racing thoughts and get them out of your mind and then return simply to being with the Lord. It's a recipe for peace. If all I do is plan, if all I do is do, if all I do is depend on myself, it's a recipe for disaster. It's always the balance, isn't it? We depend on him, and then we act. We pray, and then we decide. We begin our day with prayer. Why? Because it is he that is near. It is the coming one who is with us in our grief, in our sadness, in our work, in our wonder. It is he that gives us his peace. That author of that devotion quotes Isaiah 30. Another one of my favorite verses. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and trust shall be your strength. You see, finally, it isn't the YMCA that is our strength. It's the one who answers all our whys, Jesus Christ. I spent much of my first 30 years worrying. I hated it. I spent much of those times being anxious, this little motor inside, sometimes hardly perceptible, other times growing. Finally, I learned what that devotional book author invites us to do, is to spend time with him each day. Because when I don't, things go not as well. It is the single most important thing I do. It is why, from time to time, I remind you and encourage you to do the same. Not because of some kind of technique or some kind of specific way you have to do stuff. But to get us all focused on him. Trusting in him. Putting our lives in his hands. Not thinking they're in our hands. I rest my anxious heart in his care. I allow him to be in charge, to make the connections, to guide my thinking, to guide my plans. I begin to trust more and more in his care because I'm being attentive to him and I'm seeing it, sensing it rather than putting my focus everywhere else but him. And then I am free to be what he knows would be best. Not out of my own strength or goodness, but out of his wisdom and his peace and his presence. These weeks before Christmas are busy. Rushing around, shopping, preparing, it is easy for us to miss the point. It's always him. It's the one who is coming, the one who is knocking on our door, the one who is patiently, lovingly waiting 
for us to turn to him, open our door, listen. In the midst of it all, he is the one who comes. He still comes into every day, into every person, every moment. What shall we do? A good question for Advent. Shall we be anxious and afraid? Generally a waste of time. No, we will love the Lord our God and love our neighbor as ourselves, not out of fear, but rather out of faith, coming to know that the Lord is near every moment, perhaps setting aside a few minutes each day, each of us, to check in, to let him fill us with his peace and his presence, his very life. Uh, Paul reminds us in that Philippians text, the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, pray, turn to him, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Alleluia. On page 105 in the front of your hymnals, we confess our faith through the one who is holy. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O Lord, are holy. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. Alleluia. Come and fill our hearts, O Lord, when we are afraid. Fill our hearts with your peace when grief weighs heavy upon us. Fill our hearts with yourself when we don't know where to turn. Fill our hearts with your peace when our minds and hearts are full to overflowing with lists to be done, people to respond to. Come and fill our hearts with you, O Lord. You continue to invite us to yourself. You invite us to stop going it alone, thinking all the weight rests on our own shoulders. And you invite us to open our eyes to you. You are the king of peace. You are the fountain of goodness. You are the light of the world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, how this hurting world needs you and needs to know of you. So come and fill our hearts with you, that all that we say and do would witness to you the way we share, the way we respond, the way we treat each other, the way we speak. Help our words be shaped by your compassion, kindness, patience. Let our very presence attract others to you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, it is good for us to ask the question, what shall we do today? How shall we spend our time? A good question to ask. And perhaps the first response, the first thing, what shall we do? Perhaps the wisest might be, start the day with you, so that you might shape everything we say, think, and do the rest of the day. Come and fill our hearts with your peace. You alone, O Lord, are holy. Lord, we also pray for our missionary Didi and his wife Serafina, confident that you are using them to be light and hope and peace and help for those they touch. Continue to strengthen and encourage them in their ministry in the Congo of Africa. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. 
And we pray this day for Sadie, Karen, Jean, Lynn, Pam, Bart, and Austin, Dwayne, Jan, Josh, and for those we mention silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And here it is again. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace with one another. Thank you for remembering to stand. <laughs> in front of you, in your bulletin, you will see the words of the offering prayer. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts, that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Think about what you hear. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks. Thank you, you're right. <laughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this, remembering me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, remembering me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. The body of Christ, broken for you. As you come to the table, form two lines. Open up your hands as you are receiving the bread. Our assisting ministers will place a glass filled in front of you. Eat, drink. When you're finished, place your empty glass in the basket. Return to your place. Please be seated.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Serve the Lord.